right? We have been uh, going through a series of messages which are coming to a culmination. Um, grace in the body, and uh, this particular segment is grace and coordination in the body. We've been looking at how grace, uh, one, affects the believer, how then it affects the, the body of Christ. We've learned about our individual uh, spiritual gifts as God's ordained gifts to the body. Yes, it's a gift that he has given you as an individual, but that gift then is to be turned around and the bodies to be blessed with that gift. And no matter what local body you're a part of, that gift is to be exercised, amen, so that others can benefit from what God has given you. The Bible has promised us that each and every Christian will have at least one gift. Some of you will be blessed to have more than one gift. No one has all gifts. Because if you did, you wouldn't need a local body, right? So God has designed us in a way that we need each other. And it is good to hear as your pastor that people are exercising that gift weekly to care for other people in the body. Build each other up. And, um, and I want to thank you for doing that. Um, today we're going to be talking about the office of pastor. Um, next week, Lord willing, the office of deacon. And that'll be the end of our grace series um, for this particular uh, aspect that started at the beginning of the year. Um, so if you guys have any ideas of what you'd like, just let me know, because I haven't necessarily settled on one thing or the other. Or we maybe I just put a suggestion box on the wall and I do every week a new sermon on them. You got to give me some advance notice, though. Some of your topics I'll probably have to study for months before I do something. Uh, so what I want to do is kind of piggyback on what we started last week. And we were mention, mentioning three different titles for pastor. Um, and they're used interchangeably. So uh, you know, you, you talk to people that go to other other local bodies, and they go, "We don't have a pastor where we go. We have a we have a bishop." Um, if you get into some of the the, the black ethnic churches, um, they they tend to be called bishops. Um, the bishop's wife, uh, they call her the first lady. I mean, they got all kinds of names. Um, but uh, but I want you to understand that the word pastor and bishop and elder are used interchangeably. You see this in the Bible. Um, you could technically call my position any of those three, and you would not be wrong. You would not be unbiblical, and so don't get bent out of shape when you hear other people talk about bishops or elders, um, uh, because that is a biblical term for the leader of a local church. Now, when we get into uh, Roman Catholicism or, or some of the other isms, uh, their term bishop definitely does mean something different from a local pastor. That would be somebody that would be governing over multiple churches with the head bishop, you know, having ultimate say in all things, i.e. the Pope. Um, so understand that these three words are interchangeable. And let's look at some scripture real quick so you can see that they do go back and forth. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, it says, From Miletus he sent unto Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. This were the leaders. This was the pastors of the church. We jump then down to Acts 20, 28. He says, take heed on yourselves and to all the flock. And this is a local flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you. Here's the new term, bishops. Bishops to feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. So here again, a reference to Jesus Christ as the one who purchased uh, every single person in the pews with his own blood, including uh, the bishop who is to um, care for the local flock. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, For this cause I left thee, creep that thou shouldest set in order the things that were wanting, and appoint elders in every city as I gave thee charge. So here we see um, necessity that Jesus Christ, God, wants order in his church. Okay? Disorder, um, God's not there. Every time we read about Jesus Christ touching someone, they went from 
disorder to order. Um, Christ always leaves someone in their right mind. Uh, the gentleman who was full of devils, a thousand of them, uh, they said they found him clothed because prior to he was naked. And the term goes, and he was in his right mind. That's what Jesus Christ does. He takes disorder and makes order. He takes crooked paths and he makes them straight. Um, he, he brings peace to those who are anxious. Um, he gives grace to those who are um, condemned. Amen? So God sets things in order. So here again, see this term elder. Um, we're going on to Titus 1.7. Back to bishop. For the bishop must be blameless as God's steward. Okay? Not self-willed, not soon angry, no brawler, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. So again, a reference to the local pastor, um, a, a man that is going to lead the local flock. And again, God's steward. I, I, you're not my people. You're God's people, and I am your steward. And when God sees fit to remove me as steward and brings another steward, so be it. Um, parents, we have to look at our children the exact same way. They're not our kids. They're God's kids, and we have them for a portion of life to steward them and steward them well. Um, and, and if God takes our kids, so be it. Um, if God, if God, uh, it, they're his kids. They've always been his kids. Um, it's the same with anything in, in, in life. It's not your land, it's God's land, it's not your car, it's his car, and you're to be a good steward of it. And all the talents, all the gifts that you have, every material possession, it's God's ultimate. So, um, again, back to back to our text, seeing all three interchangeable. 1 Peter 5, 1, the elders among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder. So here's one elder exhorting the other pastors. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, who am also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So here's pastors talking to other pastors. They call themselves elders. First Peter 5, 2. Tend to the flock of God, which is among you, exercising oversight. Here's one of the, one of the traits of a pastor, oversight. Not of constraint, but willingly, according to the will of God, nor yet for filthy liquor, but of a ready Mind. So again, we see a continuation of, of what we just read in 5.1 of the elder. The elder is an overseer, exercising oversight. Uh, we continue on in the next verse. Neither as lording it over the charge allotted to you. Again, this is what a pastor is not to be a lord. Uh, you're not to bow at the feet of the pastor and, and put a pastor up on a pedestal. And if you have done that in the past, you probably got burnt because your pastor messed up. And you're like, oh my goodness, I was putting this person on a pedestal, and then they fell, and now what am I to do? Um, a pastor is a human being, um, perfect in Christ, still working on behavior and attitudes, amen? And uh, so, again, neither is lording over is charge a lot of tea, but making yourselves examples to the flock. Pastors are supposed to be examples, so much so that you would actually want to follow us, living out Christ and say, it's a man I can follow. Um, I always teach in my leadership courses, um, if you think you're a leader, look behind you every once in a while to see if anyone's following you. Because if no one's following you, you're not a leader, right? Military people, you're not going to follow a bozo into combat. You will follow a man that you can trust. Um, you'll follow him anywhere. And when the chief shepherd, that's not me, I'm an under shepherd. When the chief shepherd shall be manifested, ye shall receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. And that's true for every single one of us. Um, when Jesus shows up, he's going to he's going to crown us and bless us for being his children. So let's break down the three elder bishop and pastor and look at what the Bible says about each of these three. Elders translated presbyterios or presbyterion, what we would now call the Presbyterian Church, they take that same name, speaks of spiritual experience and qualification. Now, the Jews, uh, this was a Jewish term 
this word elder. Um, remember reading of the text, they took from the group of men, 70 elders who judged Israel. We read that in the Old Testament. Um, it typically can mean in the Bible translated older people. Um, you think of the, the long gray beard and gray hair, that would be the elder. Um, but it also, uh, in this term, uh, speaks of someone who is mature um, in the faith. And it was definitely used in, in Israel. And the early church then just took that same term elder from their Jewish traditions and brought it into Christianity to speak of their spiritual leaders as well. The next term, bishop, translated to episkopos. Now our Episcopalian churches, meaning overseer. It's also translated sopikio, to look or watch. It's going to be very close to the terms we see as a shepherd. All of you have pictured a shepherd. They're looking over their flock. We've seen that Christmas song, shepherds watching over their flocks by night. Again, it's an overseer, someone who is there. Look over, protect, provide for, feed, make sure that they are nourished. And we'll get to that in just a bit. The Gentile origin of this word bishop is one who oversees, superintends, guards, and gives directive care. One who looks over a local church, functions as an overseer. Now, scriptures are clear that the office of a bishop is not outside or above the local church, but only within the local church. So we see other, other religious groups calling their bishop, one who is a bishop over multiple churches with the head bishop, archbishops, um, and we don't read that in scripture. When the word bishop shows up, talking about a person who was given only authority within the local body and not over multiple local bodies or regions or countries or whatever it might be, as we've seen it played out today. The last term that we see used interchangeably um, is pastor. Now, this is only one place. Um, where did I? There it is. Um, I missed a slide. Let me just talk to you for a second. Pastor, only one place translated, homian, translated pastor instead of shepherd. And it's found in Ephesians 4.11. Do I have Ephesians 4.11? I don't. Yeah. Did I have it? Oh, there it is. Okay, there's my slide. Um, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. And look at this, some pastors and teachers. This is the only place where the word pastor shows up. Everywhere else, it's translated shepherd. Um, and, and we take that, and Jesus, again, takes that title of good shepherd. You can read that in John 10, 11. He is the good shepherd, and we are told that we are the sheep. Amen? Did you guys ever say that at the end, and all God's people said, and you say, bah, okay? Yeah. Remember we say that at the end of the end of our closing today. All God's people said, bah, because we're sheep. Amen? Um, so we go back to this, and it says, 1 Peter 2, 25, for ye... We're going astray like sheep, that's us, but now are turned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Notice these are capitalized. This is not reference to your local pastor, but Jesus Christ himself. Being called shepherd, i.e. translated pastor, bishop, the same. All right, in the next 20, 20, 28, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Spirit has given you bishops. Feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood, a text that we've, we've touched on already so again elder bishop and pastor are all one and and the congregation in its simplest form is a shepherd and the sheep and a local pastor the shepherd you guys are the sheep pastors to lead and feed i made that that rhyming couplet up lead and feed lead and feed um that's what we're to do feed the flock with knowledge and understanding but also lead being an example of every sermon that's ever preached so that the people would want to follow. So Christ, Christ is called an elder. It expresses the nature of the leader. He's called a bishop, the function of the leader, and the pastor, the tender strength and caring attitude of 
shepherd. Christ is the head shepherd over the universal flock with under shepherds divided into the local flocks. That's us. The local church is a body. It's a local body, has a head. Head is the local pastor, the local shepherd, or under shepherd. The under shepherd is not an absolute. What's that mean? It means that I'm not the final authority. Um, if I say something that is not found in the text, you need to challenge me. You need to come up in a kind and loving way, not in a critical or, or belligerent way. Kind and loving way and say, brother, can I talk to you about uh, something you mentioned today? Because um, um, the Spirit's been saying something different to him. Uh, the text that I read, I don't quite see it that way. Let's talk about it. That's what you should do. So the local body is a body. Local church is a body. Local body has a head. The pastor, he's an under shepherd. He is not an absolute, but a representative of Christ. Now, the pastor, a couple things, obeys God's, um, is to obey God, is to please the Lord with the functionality of love. God has given me a measure of love to bless you guys with. I'm also supposed to be a communicator of love, subservient to the head shepherd with no will or opinion of his own. There are things that I've preached that I wish I didn't have to because um, they're sometimes hard, but this is what God has called me to do. And I don't have my own opinion. I preach the will of God as we read in scripture. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what they're all supposed to do. So Christ is called the good shepherd in John 10, 14. He's called the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. And he is the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20, with local pastors being the under shepherd of all those things. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11, it says, obey them. This is in reference to you, the sheep, and your local under shepherd. Obey them and rule over you and submit to them. They watch in behalf of your souls as they that shall give account, that they may do this with joy and not with grief, for this were for this were unprofitable for you. Now, I brought this verse up last week. And again, I, I, I thank you, and I want to do it again today, for treating me and my family so very well. At the same time, this verse starts off in Hebrews, obey them the hell rule over you. Now, the rebellious spirit and all of us say, oh, no, I'm not submitting to anybody. You shouldn't submit to a, a pastor who is leading you astray, who is clearly in violation of the scripture. That should be problematic. And again, uh, we've just walked through um, biblical discipline. Um, if you have a problem with the local pastor, you shouldn't quit and leave and go down the road. That's not what it says. Just like anything else, if you have a problem with any other, other person in the body, a conflict, Bible is very clear. You are to have enough courage from God Himself to go confront the other brother or sister and straighten them out if need be. If I'm speaking something errant. You need to bring that to my attention so that we can fix that. Um, I've told my wife more than once whenever I bring someone to preach, I said, It's okay. They only preach one Sunday. And we can fix the damage if there's any done, right? Now, I screen my people. Obviously, you're not going to read in someone who's a heretic and going to be preaching crazy stuff. Um, but even if I do bring someone in and they say something that isn't what we believe, we fix that real quick. It's not a problem. But we need to see this. And as a younger person growing up in a church, I don't know if I ever took heed to this verse. Say that, okay, my local pastor has been placed here by God. I'm a member of this church, and I have a responsibility to submit to this person in matters of spiritual things. Why? Because they watch on behalf of your souls. They will give an account. Um, we're all going to give an account. Other places says uh, that a pastor is doubly judged. Um, 
the judgment comes from the people. You understand that, right? Um, you guys watch pastors like a hawk. Is he doing what he says he's doing? Um, and I've, I've tried to be careful with my kids because, you know, we jokingly say about pastor's kids. We even have acronyms, PKs. They got the toughest job on planet Earth. They think their parents have it bad. The kids got it worse because everyone's watching the kids. Um, are they actually doing what you know, their dad preaches on every Sunday morning? And oftentimes we see pastor's kids. The joke is they're very rebellious as soon as they can. They're out of here and off they go, never to come back to Christianity. That's not good. That's not good that that's a stereotype joke. Um, and I want to thank you for treating my kids well here and treating us as a family well. Why would you want to give your pastor a hard time? Look at the last line in this verse. This would be unprofitable for you. To have someone behind this lectern preaching God's word who doesn't want to be here. I read the Barna surveys, 40% of pastors on a given day want to quit. They want to quit. The families are suffering, they're lonely, they're depressed, they have addictions. Um, churches are closing, new ones are opening, but not at the same rate. More are closing than opening. So why would you want to always give pushback? I'm not saying if it's warranted, do it, but do it in a loving way, but not with grief, because this isn't going to be profitable for you. Now, so believers here we read in Hebrews are admonished to obey those who watch over them. While we don't see organizational unity beyond the local church, i.e. this church getting along with the church down the road and the church up the road. We don't read that anywhere in the text. What we do see in the text is that there's supposed to be unity within this body. Okay, Organizational unity, we have to have organization, and we also are to see spiritual unity. That the Holy Spirit is working well within this body, and that when we make a decision, it's a unified decision. Amen? That's what we do see. This happens by a series of submissions. This is the part that kind of fights against our flesh when we hear this word. You need to obey. Um, same part probably when you ladies read the part where submit to your husbands. Yeah, I don't know about that. But we have to see it as God's provision for you. God's, God's help in your life to make everything the way he intended it to be. So let's look at these series of submissions. What has to happen for unity, organization within the body, as well as spiritual unity? Everyone submits to the Holy Spirit, period. Pastors need to do that. Every sheep in the flock needs to do that. We submit to the Holy Spirit. If we rebel against the Holy Spirit, that means we're following the flesh. So every second of every day, you and I are supposed to be listening to that still small voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit that God has placed inside of each and every one of us, not something to badger us. It is a gift from God himself. You've got to see the Holy Spirit as a friend. He's not the convictor. And, and man, I grew up in a church where the Holy Spirit was the badger, the convictor, the, the part of Jesus that lives inside of you that beats you up whenever you did something wrong. And the Bible says the exact opposite. When we do something wrong, the Holy Spirit is the one that is gently reminding you and me that we are a child of God. And the attitude or the behavior that we're engaging in is not fitting for a child of God. It's the love of Christ that compels men to come back. Not the badgering, not the drippy faucet, not the, not the guilt and shame. It's the love of Christ that brings us back. And if we submit to the Holy Spirit, guess what? Life is a lot easier. So, step number one, we all submit to the Holy Spirit. Step two, the body then submits to their leader, the under-shepherd, the pastor. 
trusting the Holy Spirit that God is leading this man in the direction that he wants the body to go. Thirdly, that under shepherd, that pastor, bishop, elder, whatever you want to call him, directly responsible then to the chief shepherd. So this is the series of submissions that brings spiritual unity to the body, brings organization to the body, all brought to you first by the Holy Spirit's submission. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 12 and 13 says this, but we beseech you, brethren, to know them. Okay, this is your leaders in the church. This is an intimate knowledge to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them exceedingly highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Again, this verse is related to as much as you can be at peace with one another. We've already covered this back in the discipline. We're not going to get along and agree on everything, but live as peaceably as much as you can with one another. And in doing so, you bring order and spiritual unity to the body. You might not like the decision, but you're called to be part of this body. And if, if the whole body is moving in this direction and you're the holdout. Okay, this is where the submission part comes in. As much as you can, be at peace among yourselves as a body of believers. To respect this person, to show love towards them. Pastors are to be retreated with respect. It's translated appreciate. Appreciate. To know intimately. Signifies a close relationship with your under shepherd. One of appreciation, love, and cooperation. How do we do this? Or why do we do this? Why should we respect our pastor? Pastors, if you go to a church with more than one. Not only for what they do, but primarily, look at this verse that's still up on the screen, but primarily because of the calling which they have been called to for their work's sake. Poll I read recently said that the role of a pastor, once esteemed in society, you guys remember this? You never curse around police officers. You clean up your act around them. You, even the most disrespectful kid would all of a sudden get respectful around a police officer. There was one other person in society you didn't do that to. Pastors. Oh, you're a minister. And everyone would clean up their act, sit up straight. Whether they went to church on a regular basis or not, somebody told them, respect these two people. Position of pastor now ranks up somewhere around a garbage collector now. And I'm not saying garbage collectors aren't the coolest people. I've always wanted to ride on the back of a truck and do it legally, go down the road. <laughs> but it's not esteemed anymore. We need to esteem our pastors. When you meet a pastor in society, thank them for what they do. Because they might not be getting it from their local flock. I thank you guys for your appreciation and love that you give us all the time. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 says this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Here we see the only two offices that we ever read about in our Bible. The office... The office of bishops, i.e. pastors, shepherds, elders, and the office of deacons. So let's talk about the calling, qualifications of, of, of uh, this office of deacon. First, they are um, called of God. In Acts 20, 28, we've already read this twice already. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops. So there is a calling of God placed upon the heart of men to step forward to be a pastor. For me, it was probably right around age 14, 15, when God said, step up. Um, and I got opportunity in my church. 
my local body. Um, my youth leader had a had an illness from his childhood, and oftentimes he'd be hospitalized for 30 days or more at a time so he could get better. Um, no one wanted to really do anything with the youth. He was definitely committed, but his health just wasn't perfect. And I said, do you want some help? He goes, that would be great. So I was already teaching lessons to the rest of the youth at age 15. Um, that carried on while I went to school. Um, and I, I went to school for four years in college. And those four years, I was doing leadership at both my college as well as still running the youth group at my local church. And confirmation came from my calling when other people in the church approached me and started saying things to me about that. Um, many of you know, I've never gone to seminary. Never got any theological training outside of the training that I got sitting in the pew as a sheep. Um, and that's the calling of God. In which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops. Feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. So that's the first qualification. They're called of God, confirmed by others. Here's the next one that we read in 1 Corinthians. There's an unshakable conviction amongst the people that are called to preach. 1 Corinthians 9.16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, for woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. There's a drive, there's a, a, a conviction amongst those who are called, oh man, please don't, please don't. Take me away from this. I'll go crazy if I don't get to preach the gospel. And I, when I go on vacation with my family, I, I'm missing it. I like sitting in that pew listening to someone else. But at the same time, I'm like, wow, I'm missing out, I'm missing out. There's something about it. Um, but I need, to, I need to do that more often. I need to take time off and go places and, and sit and rest and let Someone else come and preach here to you guys as well. So, one, it's a calling of God. Two, there is an unshakable conviction to the point of they don't get to spread the gospel. They go back crazy. Thirdly, it's confirmed by the local body. Acts 13, 3. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So there's a calling of the local church is what we oftentimes see. Um, and it's confirmed by others. Historically, we find that the apostles, historically, we find that the apostles were the ones who appointed the new pastors. When Paul uh, went out and was setting up the churches in different regions, he had the position of apostleship, and he could literally say, all right, I'm leaving. I got to go to the next town to spread the gospel and get people saved um, and then set up a church there. But in order to keep the organization going, the spirit of unity, I'm going to appoint elders. And they would he would start picking out mature men in the faith um, who could lead that local body to keep the continuity going as he went to uh, the next town, city, region to preach the gospel. That's how leaders were found. The apostles literally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would point and, and, and choose men. And those men would then become the leaders of the church. The apostleship is over, folks. Um, there are no more apostles. Um, despite what YouTube channel people say, um, there are no new apostles. Uh, there won't be any more new apostles. That is, that is something that God appointed at the beginning and has not since then. That was one way that they were uh, appointed by the newly established uh, churches. The apostles did it. Secondly, then they were appointed by current elders. So elders or leaders within the church as they maybe got to a, a certain age or a health condition came upon them. They said, I need to step down. I will step over and say, who's going to be the next one? Because they had been watching over the flock. They had seen who God maybe had touched. And they said, it's it, the, the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit has said to me that you're the one 
they would confirm that with other elders within the local body and uh, then appoint those uh, people as current elders. But when the church has no more elders, what do you do? Um, when it's not just multiple elders, but just one. Well, the Congregationalists, which we talked about before, um, did something which we call now an ordination council. And it's a way for them to try to preserve that um, and allow local pastors to still be appointed by other local pastors. So what does this look like? Um, an ordination council. Local pastors are called by a local church to recommend or reject called candidate. Now, the Holy Spirit obviously gives us all discernment when a new pastor is called church body either you guys will find in my case i was somebody already within the church or you will call someone from outside the church which is either recommended probably by somebody that you know or an application that shows up when you send out the call that the church needs filled um, you as a church then can take this candidate and you can submit them to an ordination council and say Run them through your mill and tell us what you think. And they will uh, set it up and they will uh, have this person write ordination papers, which is basically a testimony of their salvation and what they believe about key things, key doctrine truths in the Bible. And they will defend that in front of the ordination council. They'll be asked a series of questions. And uh, just to make sure that uh, the guy's not a quack, and that you're not getting yourself into a lot of trouble. Are they foolproof? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I've seen it with my own eyes, and six to nine months later, the church is getting rid of someone who they never should have had behind the lectern in the first place. Um, but it is in an effort to try to keep people out from behind the pulpit that don't meet all the qualifications that God has um, set in place. Again, the local body is sovereign. That local body can accept or reject what the ordination council says. Even if the ordination council says, we don't think he's the right guy, you could say, thank you for your time, but we're going to let him come in anyway, which you should be cautious about that, especially if those you've called in the ordination council are trusted and respected people in the community. Um, I've sat on, I've not sat on an ordination council, but I have gone many ordination services for pastors that are within our association. All right, so why am I talking to you guys about some of these things? Um, we have a, a constitution which says one thing, and this is what we've decided to do. Um, we don't, in our constitution, have it in a way that the pastor has to be ordained, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, is it wrong to be ordained? Not at all. And we could we could do ordination ourselves, um, or we could get ordained through the two associations that we're a part of, Venture Church Network or Network 220. Both of them will ordain pastors within their um, within their networks or associations. Um, but we don't have it written up that way that it is necessary. Um, but again, it's not a bad thing. I'm sharing all this with you because um, I want us to understand that sometimes the way that some churches get very dogmatic about it is not biblical. Argument can be made um, either way, um, whether elders are elected by other elders in the church, okay, and then the church approves of that, or a congregational selection, which is in many cases what we practice here. But again, we should not be dogmatic about it um, because um, we just don't see it that clear in Scripture. It's just not made that way. And I think God did it that way for a reason. But there are three things that we can be certain about for the call of the pastor. Um, one, um, it's called by the local church. Oh, I did, let me skip through this. This is what I've already talked to you about. It's a sovereign choice of God. Number one, they're called by God. We know that is a fact. And if they can't distinctly tell you when they were called, chances are they've never been called. 
Um, secondly, a deep, deep unshakable conviction. And again, oftentimes you're going to see this in their track record. Um, they're going to show evidence that they have not given up on the faith ever. And no matter where they go, they like and want to be and have been involved in the leadership or, can, or carrying out of the gospel message. And thirdly, confirmed by the local body. Those of you that weren't here when I was brought in, um, we brought in two candidates prior to, to my recommendation, and those two candidates did not meet our 75% um, majority vote. When I was brought in, it was unanimous with one abstention. And um, we took that as a sign um, that God said, you're the man for the time. How long? That's up to him and technically you, according to our Constitution. Um, but again, if we submit to the Holy Spirit, I think um, I don't think we're going to have a problem with the unity. And I don't think we're going to have a problem with the order as well. Um, Paul said elsewhere, he goes one place he was upset because there wasn't any order in one of the local churches. When he circled back around, it was kind of chaotic. And then uh, he he set some more leaders up, and he came back around a little bit later. He says, I thank God for the order amongst you. Um, and I praise God for the leaders who have stepped up and, and have helped uh, sustain this body for the last decade. Amen? So, grace in the body um, is an important thing. And if we operate correctly with submission to the Holy Spirit, the coordination in the body um, will only produce appropriate fruit. Amen. You've uh, looked in your bulletin this morning. I had a couple quotes and I love a Steve McVeigh's quote. Preaching grace produces fruit. Preaching law produces nuts. We're not nuts. Amen. So I'm going to keep preaching grace and I'm going to trust God for the fruit in your lives. And I'm, all, I'm already seeing it. I'm already seeing you guys reaching out to others with your gifts from on high, blessing each other, and this body um, only growing closer and closer uh, as the day approaches. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and we'll pray together. I'll ask Arlene to come forward and close us in a hymn.